uh, there's quite a bit to cover here. You know, and I, one of the things that disappoints me when I give a talk is I do talk a lot about chemistry, and I know geologists just love chemistry. <laughs> it, it's really so simple. That don't be taken aback by some of the terminology and the like uh, because it's so applicable to what you're trying to do. A lot of this I learned from cohorts over at Mitchell Energy. You, you see John Huggins, Dan Stewart, and Kip Bowker over there that uh, uh, when I would go see them, they'd say, you know, forget all that fancy stuff. Tell, can we produce gas here or not? <laughs> okay. But um, in any case, so I'm trying to put it in that perspective and please ask a question if there's something that I go over that uh, doesn't make sense or doesn't really follow from uh, an abbreviation or something like that. So this is what I'm going to try to do, a brief introduction, some background information. I've really put the petroleum systems part of it on, on the back burner, so to speak, uh, uh, in this talk. But then I want to really move into items that are more related to targeting. And I want to finish off with a, a, just a short mention of Alpine High. This is, um, I just love this slide from EOG. Uh, you've perhaps seen it in their investor presentations. Um, they have the, these 11 factors for targeting. And I wrote to Bill Thomas and I said, well, why don't you put out the Rosetta Stone for that? That would be a little <laughs> more useful uh, than just this graphic. But what, what you see is how they've utilized different pieces of information such as geochemistry and setting targets for example in the lower Eagleford versus the upper, upper Eagleford. But it's not just about oil content, it's how the oil is stored and it's also about what's around the best zones. So the baffles and barriers for getting a good stimulation and uh, uh, monitoring what's going on through time. So where do you run into this? Well. What happens where, uh, when we have a source rock that expels hydrocarbons? Uh, really, one of the key topics of this talk is fractionation. Every time those hydrocarbon or petroleum molecules move, they segregate. They change composition just continually. And so I'm going to show you some data on that. So just moving, uh, this is more or less modeled after the um, uh, Williston Basin, uh, if you will, putting the lower Bakken, if you will, or a source rock here that expels oil into a leaner uh, formation, such as the dolomite or sand, whatever you might have. But what happens is that oil quality is dramatically improved just by that expulsion process. So suddenly, if you took the total petroleum composition in the, in the shale itself, you might have a 37 or lower API gravity, yet when you get it into that middle member, it's 42 plus, okay? So this fractionation process is very dramatic and of course when you look through the Permian Basin, particularly the thick wolf camp, there's so many things going on with the movement of hydrocarbons, how you produce it, how effectively it's stimulated, how, what the range of the stimulation is, you really alter the, uh, uh, or have severe fractionation. And not necessarily a bad thing, a good thing. I put this up front, uh, normally I put this at the end of a uh, talk, but really have pushed the envelope on moving more towards uh, engineering type assessment because of the economics primarily. Uh, for example, when you look at, well, uh, uh, Alpine High, for example, uh, looking at some of the GORs, you know, the investor community looks at that and says, wow, you're getting pretty gassy out there, aren't you? And so the value is very important. And so coming back full circle to the geochemistry, we're trying to get an idea of where we want to be. Uh, EOG's target, quite simply, was the volatile oil window. And uh, that's, uh, I've been working with the Tampico Masantla, and that's what our focus is there, to get the, the good high quality oil, lower uh, resins and asphaltines, which we'll talk about, and a bit of gas push. So I put that in the context from engineering documents, but also put in different aspects of what we can get out of uh, geochemistry, including making a prediction pre-completion, sometimes pre-drilling, uh, or even pre-leasing of GORs. Well, uh, this uh, is a, from Sevens Oil and Gas, but I think it's a, just a beautiful slide. I don't know, if, I've seen several of these, so I don't know where all they originate, so I gave it credit from their presentation. But showing such things as the Klein Shale into the Wolf Camp in the Midland and into the uh, Delaware Basin. Well, one of the things I want to do today is maybe make a, just a very minor comparison of Wolf Camp 
in the Midland versus the Delaware Basin. Stratigraphy, <laughs> you talk about a nightmare for somebody who hasn't worked this basin uh, much, and you come in and you hear all these different names depending where you're at. I mean, it was hard enough with uh, between Core Labs and uh, EOG talking about the Avalon versus the Leonard and so forth. I mean, it gets very complicated. And so for the petroleum systems, though, we want to know all the conventional reservoirs, so we have to understand that. And we certainly want to know the source rock and potential unconventional type plays. So this is stratigraphy. And I, I was asked, all these slides are down prepare, proprietary. See, I, I have a little bit of George Bush in me, so I can't always speak <laughs> the word correct. But these slides are all available. You can have every single one of them, OK? <clears throat> to burn, to do it or not. <laughs> okay. Put on the website. Yeah, okay. Well, these are the petroleum systems, and this is from a, a number of people going back to Jones and Smith in 1965. One of my favorite people of all time, Jack Williams, uh, who really has Williston Basin fame uh, uh, on the uh, petroleum systems up there. But Jack Williams presented a paper in 1977 from analysis of 500 plus oils and he sent me, he didn't write a paper on it, but he sent me his slide notes. It's uh, just a beautiful presentation, and basically it's included and rolled into this, along the work with the work that I've done with Ron Hill primarily, and more recently, uh, uh, John Curtis and John Zuckerberg at uh, Geomark. But what I'm breaking out, and I'm not gonna, go, don't have time to go into the detail, is different faces, basically, or different units within these rocks. And basically, I'm talking about some subtle changes, but oftentimes it's the difference between a marine carbonate and a marine shale, which yields different properties. So <laughs> this seemed like a, an easy question to some extent. Why is it difficult? Well, they're tight. <laughs> okay, that, that presents the problems. Now, I always, I, it always annoyed me that, uh, particularly EOG always talked about molecular size. Yeah, okay, molecular size has something to do with it. What has a lot to do with it is polarity. These big molecules that I'm going to talk about are sticky. <laughs> they don't like to go anywhere, <laughs> okay? They do get out, they do um, migrate, but they're stripped and fractionated entirely in that process. The other thing that's overlooked is they affect wettability. These have hydrogen bonding capability, so it's not necessarily that they're just absorbed to uh, organics. They also have the ability to bind with water wet clays. And so uh, we'll talk briefly about that. And certainly GOR and pressure are, are factors as well. Well, you can, uh, I think at one time Devin had some 80 or 90 factors for um, uh, risk factors for these plays. But today I, I've listed some here, but I've highlighted the ones that I, I want to talk about. Oil crossover, basically, <laughs> is there free oil in the uh, compartment you're looking at? What the maturity, which also has an impact on uh, the SARA. I'm going to come back to that, API gravity, GOR. Other things that I, I just had to admit from this talk are uh, water saturation, organophasis differences, brittleness, and really the barriers and baffles. Okay, SARA, I'm going to talk about that quite a bit today. When you look at petroleum, the SARA composition is hydrocarbons, the saturates and aromatics, purely chemical, okay? So it's hard to, to tell you that when you produce oil, you're producing non-hydrocarbons, at least in part. But the polymers and resins are technically, chemically, non-hydrocarbons. So one of the first things we want to know, <laughs> well, is there a good quantity of oil in this rock? Okay, that doesn't mean it's producible. That, we, but we do have to get a certain volume to meet the economics. So when we measure, um, for example, in the laboratory by Rocky Howe, we measure an oil content called S1, and you've seen that in many reports. What's missing on that is no matter how well you try to preserve the light hydrocarbons, coming up the well bore, getting processed, ground, sampled, you have an evaporative loss of oil. Think about it. We're dealing with a volatile oil to a condensate. What's the loss? 80% plus. Okay. So what you're measuring in the Rocky Bell S1 could be 20% of the oil. The other factor, and this goes back more or less to producibility issues, there's a part of that petroleum that carries over into the S2, particularly in an organic rich source rock. 
So it likes to hold on to those uh, polar compounds and they show up a lot in this uh, S2, the pyrolysis peak. So how do you get around that? You have to extract the rock in order to get the true carrageen content and to get the best Tmax data of one of the maturity parameters. I'll show you a way to get back at this evaporative loss, which is the key to getting towards uh, API gravity and uh, GOR predictions. So you have the overlap of this free oil, and it's not present, not obvious necessarily from the Rocky Valve. So when I look at the total oil, I'm looking at primarily at the S1 and the whole rock. The difference between the whole rock and extracted rock, that pulls out this portion, and then somehow coming up with what I've been calling lost oil. Um, not to be confused with lost gas, uh, such as in the uh, desorption analysis. So how the, re the way I get at the evaporative losses is, is basically a GC fingerprint, and so we'll talk a bit about that. Well, here's some uh, old data that I had uh, showing uh, Wolfcamp TOC and S1 data. And I, I love looking at this ratio, just S1 to TOC, I've called it the oil crossover ratio. Because whenever you see the oil content, just from the basic S1 analysis, exceed the TOC, you have potentially producible hydrocarbons. Where did we use this? We used it in conventional reservoirs to find bypass pay a lot of the time. So uh, it was a very handy tool. Now I use it looking at uh, different um, uh, source rocks to see if they have uh, excess petroleum that could be produced. Now, you have to be careful with that because you also have to understand what the quality of that petroleum is. Okay, the recovery factor can vary. So when I look down here, you can see we've got good TOCs throughout this entire set of data from the, the Wolf Camp, but we only have oil crossover in certain locations. You can see we have a great TOC, probably one of the highest of these two, there's no crossover. And think about the Bakken Shale, which has TOCs of 15 and the S2s of 80 to 150. You're not going to get that oil to flow. <laughs> okay, that's, that's a tough nut. Bakken shale, not Bakken middle member. Completely different. And part of that is because of this absorptive capacity, <coughs> the chemical characteristics uh, of the rock. So what I'm looking at is then oil versus absorption. So I want an excess of oil, but I also need a minimum absorptive capacity. This absorptive capacity is directly proportional to the TOC. So, is the highest TOC necessarily the best productive inter interval? Absolutely not. You've got to have the oil in excess of its absorptive capacity. Why do the hybrids work so well? Why do the conventionals work so well? Because there's no TOC. There's nothing holding on. It's that Velcro. You know, you've got pieces of Velcro and they tend to latch onto each other. And that's those polar compounds. That's basically what they're doing. But, and that's the reason you want to be volatile oil, because you minimize these polar and uh, resinous uh, uh, compounds. So when I look at, uh, uh, I actually didn't know if this worked. We first did it on the Barnett Shale and uh, it seemed to be quite reasonable. It's actually how we figured out that uh, all the gas in the Barnett Shale was basically coming from oil cracking. It wasn't coming from a carriage and cracking, but from the retained oil. But when I look at the uh, data, geochemical data, I take and restore the uh, original TOC and hydrogen <laughs> index, and then from an extent of conversion, that is thermal maturity, I could see how much oil this has the potential to generate at a given thermal maturity. What's the opposite of that? The opposite is going back to the restored oil. Okay, what can I identify in terms of the oil content, both that that we see in the S1, that that carries over into S2, and that evaporative loss, which is a big factor. When I compare those two, depending on the system, I can see dramatic differences. Seldom do they, they agree. Usually this one uh, uh, is much different from the uh, carrageen, much lower, I'm sorry, much higher, uh, because it's expelled a great deal of the oil, okay? So, for example, when I looked at the Eagleford, I could see that wow, we had these 70 um, uh, million BOE per section, and uh, yet when we did the uh, free oil, we were getting 150, okay? So that oil went somewhere, <laughs> okay? So if they matched up, that would mean that you had no expulsion. And there, there's a, a great deal of error in that. I don't want to 
great deal, maybe not the, the right word, but there certainly is an error function involved in that. And just a brief comparison of the Delaware to the Midland Basin. Uh, this is a data set you can see. I don't have the end number and I don't remember what it is, but quite a number of analysis that we've acquired over the years. And this is the restored original TOC and the restored carriage content. I've published on this, so I'm not going to go into that. But the best fit of that line and the, uh, um, the M factor, the slope factor, that 5.2, that's actually the original hydrogen index. So you multiply that 5.2 by 100, you get 520 for the original HI. Okay? Or you can take individual components and divide them out. Why is that so important? Because we talk about TOC, TOC, TOC. What do you have to have for hydrocarbons? Hydrogen, 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 okay? So this hydrogen index is a key component of producing or generating hydrocarbon. So you can see Delaware Basin, slightly lower TOCs, lower hydrogen indices, at least on this data set, but as opposed to the Midland Basin where it gets up to 652. So when I make a comparison of that, I look at the Wolf Camp in the Midland Basin, and I say, wow, this can generate 37, um, I didn't put, <laughs> okay, it's millions, I did do that correctly. <laughs> okay. I thought it, it generates more than 37 barrels, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. okay, 37 million barrels per 100 feet of section. A lot of times, you know, I'm working across a basin, you know, you're in a particular play, you, have, you know you have 1,000 feet of wolf cam. I just normalize everything to 100 feet to put it in perspective. If you had 1,000 feet, you multiply it by 10, okay? The, the um, Delaware Basin sets at 30, so still a very attractive number for any prospector, that's for sure. What's the, one of the differences of the Midland Basin in general, and if you look at the entirety of the basin, isn't as highly converted as in the Delaware Basin. So you can see at 65% conversion, we're at 25 uh, uh, million BOE per 100 feet uh, in a section whereas we're about the same value in the wolf camp. And it simply is higher, more highly converted. One of the issues that I've run into in the past and more recently, uh, when I worked with the Mitchell Energy folks and we had cuttings from the Midland Sample Library, and many of you have seen this, we saw Barnett Shell TOC values that were two and a half, three percent. And Dan Mitchell and Kent Bogger, no, no, it's four, five, six percent TOC. Well, okay, we're dealing with cuttings, we just knew it was lower, and I really thought it was a mix master effect. You know, you're drilling through massive carbonates, you get into the top of the shale, and you're mixing it up with some lean materials. You can run an Excel spreadsheet and see that. More recently, this is from 2012, Gun Oil, and uh, thank goodness, uh, I appreciate Bob Gunn and the crew at Gun Oil at the time released these data to me, but they drilled a well in Fisher County that some of you may have looked at for, as a prospect for the uh, Klein. But it was an offset to a well drilled in the 1970s. Okay, so now we had archived cuttings from the 1970s versus fresh cuttings and sidewall core. And I was particularly interested at the time in S1, okay? How much oil did I lose out of that just sitting there? And you can see uh, the old cuttings had 1.05, the uh, fresh cuttings had, uh, uh, that's actually sidewall core, had 5.75, so a factor of over five for that. But uh, going back to the TOC issue, you can see we got 3% TOC, whereas we got 4.5% on the fresh cuttings and 5% over 5% on the rotary sidewall core. Now, bear in mind, it, it was a point, point sample with the rotary sidewall core, so uh, we're comparing a little bit of apples to different kinds of apples, <laughs> okay? But uh, you can see the difference. And uh, so you see TOC is lower on the old cuttings, S1 is certainly lower, no surprise there. But S2 is also lower. And you can see it's a factor of two to a factor of three. What is the surprising part of this? And we're looking at exactly the same interval. Look at the carbonate carbon content. Okay, those old cuttings have about 18% carbonate carbon. Okay, whereas the fresh cuttings and sidewall core, less than 10, down to six. Well, why is that? And I think, quite simply, we have weathered cuttings. They're oxidized, okay? 
That's at least my hypothesis. So you've got both the mixed master effect from drilling through these lean carbonates, and you have the potential for um, uh, oxidation. And you can imagine, you know, if you're working maybe North Dakota and you look at samples that have been stored in North Dakota, they might be a little better than samples stored in Midland, Texas for the last 40 years, okay? So uh, some things perhaps going on there. And this is from a, a paper that I reviewed and um, uh, from the USGS, and it shows that the humble um, um, cutting samples, which are shown by these red dots, did not agree with what the USGS was coming up with in terms of hydrogen index, that's present day, versus reflectivity. Um, and by reflectivity, I don't mean vitronite reflectivity. I mean, they measured reflectivity of whatever organic molecules or masterals they found there, which would most certainly be pyrobitumin at high levels of thermal maturity. So they would tend to uh, reflect a little more highly than vitronite. When you take a look at the cuttings data, you can see it doesn't match up. But when you pull out of that same data set, just the core data, it matches up almost perfectly. So what's the difference? All the data from the USGS uh, came from Chesapeake. I, I can't remember who all contributed, but all very fresh, all very recent samples, mostly core. Okay? And so again, you see this big difference. So what's the caution? I've used that Midland sample library for, I don't know, probably 50,000 samples. There is a caveat when you use this. So if you get that data, you're probably dealing in minimum values. Okay. Well, thermal maturity. Uh, name your poison. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I know Matt, you're a vitrographer and Waheed. Vitronite reflectance, the industry standard. Shoot me. <laughs> okay. okay, we're dealing with marine shales. What are my chances of finding abundant woody plant debris? You name it. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. You <laughs> went very little. Okay. So we've, we've got a problem, and how typically that's addressed is doing a profile, looking up hole at other intervals that are more type 3 carrageen or mixed type 2, where you can find some vitronite. But this is a tough uh, uh, number to come up with, particularly when you're trying to make very exacting predictions, either on API gravity or um, uh, GOR. And so there's a whole variety of techniques, and I've always viewed this as a risking process. How do I assess and determine what the true interpretive thermal maturity is? Well, I want data, and I want it to either agree or if it disagrees, I want to be able to sort through why it doesn't agree. And uh, there are a variety of reasons for that. But I want to really emphasize what I think is currently the best technique, and that's quantitative aromatic hydrocarbons. That's perhaps more than you wanted to hear, but you get it. <laughs> okay. Quantitative, you can reproduce this over and over again. It doesn't depend on the lab. It doesn't depend on who ran the mass spec that day. It has no dependency on an individual, okay? And so um, the other thing is you can apply it not only to rocks, you can apply it to oils, okay? So now you have uh, an additional means of comparison. And here's the, the typical dilemma. You know, you look at, you risking it and you say, well, wow, everything agrees. Ah, I can interpret this, <laughs> okay? And then you get into those cases where, wow, we're right at the borderline of the black oil window into the volatile oil window, which is correct, okay? And you have to sort through it and make a call on this. I mean, that's what you folks used to pay me for. You can still pay me if you want, uh, but uh, nonetheless. <laughs> so let, uh, think about this. Why does vitronite reflectivity increase with maturation? Well, it has to do with aromatization. So now we're suddenly, we're looking at aromatic hydrocarbons. Technically, this is not a new approach. Of methylphenanthrenes were looked at in the 1970s or 80s, and what we found were they work really well on coley materials. Well, if we have coley material, we can do vitronite reflectance, okay? So what we're looking for is something to work on the entire range, particularly of unconventional type settings. So the other default is to go to, um, okay, we didn't find vitronite, so we'll measure bitumen. And we'll leave that 
we'll just call it bitumen, that could be um, or organic macerals. Well, there's two common uh, equations to correlate to uh, vitronite reflectance, a Jacob equation and a Landis and Castaño. I know uh, Core Labs tends to use the Jacob calculation. I've always, uh, because I knew Charlie Landis so well and John Castaño, I've always used theirs. Key thing, you're at 1% vitronite reflectance equivalency, and what happens? <laughs> okay, okay, I, I have either volatile oil or perhaps even dry gas. <laughs> okay. that, that doesn't answer the question, so um, uh, that leaves us with a weakness. Tmax data, um, I always use Tmax data, there's always caveats. When you compare whole rock with extracted rock, this is Bakken, you can see that uh, this is the one-to-one -one line when you extract it. You remove a lot of these absorbed components that tend to skew the, the pyrolysis peak to lower values. So what happens? You get a lower Tmax value. And you can see that this is from the partial area, the EOG samples that were released to the North Dakota Geological Survey. The generality is that uh, the whole rocks suggest 0.62% RO, whereas the uh, extracted rocks suggest 0.7. Now this isn't moving you towards a volatile oil window, but what I'm saying is you're basically less than 10% converted at, point, uh, at 0.62, whereas you might be 15 to 30% converted, depending on the kinetics of decomposition, at 0.7. So it can make a dramatic difference as it does in the uh, Bakken. I wanted to address this because I've, I never actually published the data that supported the equation going from Tmax to RO, okay? The reason is I can't find it anymore, <laughs> okay? That was done uh, uh, in the uh, 90s, and I think I put it in a presentation the night before uh, giving a talk at AAPG or something. And uh, so, um, it's been questioned, so I went back and dug through the literature. Any place I could find a, a Tmax and a paired measured vitronite reflectance, I assembled it into this table. There are over 4,000 plus analyses in these, but my correlation is based on a range of Tmax from 430 to 485. So for each correlation, there's the number of samples is 10. So, and I, I think there's 10, it's 10 by 10, so the n equal 100. Statistically, not entirely valid, but what happens? When you look at the 2001 equation, we get, uh, it was published as this. Um, the 2018 from these data shows something slightly different, but look at the values. Very comparable all the way through, particularly when we get here at the 455 range. That's where I'm really interested in uh, defining a, a particular type of product and, and so forth. So I don't really think there's any change of that. So take it or leave it. Uh, there are caveats with not only vitronite reflectance, there's caveats with Tmax. A lot of people like to use carbon isotopes, and I do too. Bear in mind, when you get up in that 1.5% range, you get something called isotopic rollover, where the ethane actually gets lighter. So we have a marching scale here going from 0.8 up to over 3% following these trend lines here for methane versus pro, um, ethane and uh, propane versus ethane. But when rollover occurs, it moves in the opposite direction. So you can see, uh, uh, particularly in here, it, it might sit out here at 2%, but it's suggesting it's 1.1. So watch for that rollover if you're using carbon isotopic data. Well, one of my good friends, uh, Ron Hill, uh, did some work while he was at UCLA and uh, showed from, this is from experimental data, so pyrolysis GC in uh, gold tubes um, uh, and mass spectrometry. And he used, these are all aromatic hydrocarbons. So we won't go into the names there, for example, tetramethylbenzenes. I know that really excites you. When I used to go in and tell Bill Thomas, wow, well, we have a lot of tetramethylbenzene there. He would just slap me. <laughs> okay. But you can see that Ron's correlation, because he was doing working with rock extract, so he, he had this correlation. Building on that, uh, Don Rocher and John Zumberg over at Geomark have come up with different ratios, and uh, uh, this shows just some aromatic ratio yields and their correlation to RO. Now, I've already told you RO, measuring vitronite, is a moving target. Who did it? What did they measure? 
and so forth. So now, how in the world are we coming up with a correlation? That is a problem. But this is quantitative, quantitative data. I don't care what the scale is. If Don told me, okay, the equivalent vitronite reflectance is 20, <laughs> okay, and I'm getting a volatile oil, that's all I need to know right there. Now my scale is set, okay? Fortunately, it's very similar though because Don did do some correlation work. So when we see something at 1% uh, from these aromatic hydrocarbons, we're right at that volatile oil window point. So it has worked incredibly well. Uh, at EOG, a uh, geologist would request vitronite reflectance and I'd say, okay, <laughs> we can get that, but would you rather get the right answer? Okay. And really what set this off for me was when a well was drilled and it uh, flowed gas, I'm, I'm sorry, it flowed liquids, but it was recorded at 1.9 vitronite reflectance. Okay, and I said, okay, I'm done with this <laughs> on marine shales. Let's just get the aromatic hydrocarbons. So I can be a bit of a preacher. I hope you understand that. So this is my philosophy, <laughs> okay? Another thing that uh, is necessary to talk about is oil cracking. This term oil cracking drives me up the wall because nobody wants to define oil. Okay, what is oil? Well, I tend to call it petroleum, okay, because um, uh, that includes the entire composition. So this is some hydrous pyrolysis data showing uh, the relatively quick cracking of the organic matter and then oil cracking as defined in this particular paper shown over here. So my question is, I guess nothing happens in between. So that it just doesn't seem quite right to me and this is in that most recent publication. So, um, so I, I, like, <laughs> I, I like this part of the presentation because again I'm showing the hydrous pyrolysis decomposition and the oil cracking which is really saturate fraction cracking. cracking. So these are high energy decomposition. But one of the authors of this hydrous and the uh, high temperature also published these data with Francois Behar in 2008 showing the kinetics for the aromatics and the NSOs, the resins, and you can see they're cracking in the oil window. So there's things going on. This oil is continually cracking, restructuring, changing. How else do you explain changes in API gravity? You don't start with 30 gravity oil and say 30 gravity oil until you get to the gas window. It just doesn't work like that. And one of the things that I put in here was the BP, it's really the um, uh, Pepper and Todd 1995 oil to gas cracking. They use the term oil. But you can see, I think that is very realistic and, and in terms of understanding cracking. Well, okay, this is fine because this is my pet peeve, right? What does it mean for you? Well, what it means is, what's happening? These resins, these polar compounds, are cracking. Okay, so you can see here we have high resin content. What do we have here? Low saturates. As the resins decrease, the saturate content increases. But what does that mean in terms of API gravity? You can see as API gravity increases, saturates increase, and the uh, resins decrease. Pretty straightforward. They're cracking. <laughs> okay. So and likewise, looking at where this magical number is that I cited earlier, I'm really looking at being less than 3,500 standard cubic feet per, st per stock tank. You know what I mean. <laughs> the more George Bush sneaks in there, doesn't it? Okay. Um, in any case, uh, and I know uh, much of the production, particularly in the Delaware Basin, is moving up on this window. But, you know, obviously there's good value if there's a lot of liquids there because it's priced according to uh, oil prices. So that's still good, but you would rather be in this window truly economically. And that seems to be occurring based on basin modeling at about 1.5, which I <laughs> tend to agree with. So I mentioned fractionation. All this fractionation is occurring in the source rock when it migrates to a conventional trap, if it undergoes secondary migration to another trap, but it also is fractionated when you produce it. So what you produce at the surface and what are in the reservoir can be categorically different materials in terms of petroleum. So just looking at this in terms of the oil that's generated, I keep saying Sarah, that's saturates, 
aromatics, resins, and asphaltenes. A lot of times I combine these and just say polars. Um, they do have different decompositions, but they tend to decompose almost completely in the oil window, and the saturates and aromatics, particularly saturates, increase uh, with that cracking. Big difference is they're those non-hydrocarbons, the resins and asphaltenes, highly absorptive. They're viscous. Uh, as compared to the saturates, which are non-polar, the aromatics largely non-polar and non-absorptive. So they, they don't mind moving around. They're, they escape very readily. Not as good as methane, but uh, quite, quite nicely. So looking at the structure of this, and this really leads to the wettability issues, okay? What we're looking at with these resins and asphaltines is surfactants, basically, or a form of a surfactant. So they have oxygen, they have sulfur. These materials will hydrogen bond. So water on a mineral surface, no big deal to them. They'll hook right up with it via hydrogen bond. So looking at, and most of the work I've done on this comes from enhanced oil recovery, where they're looking at how do we get this oil to move out of here because it's absorbed using these resins and asphaltines. They tend to call everything asphaltines, but I think, I think they're, uh, it includes the uh, resins. So what happens with uh, mobility? Well, i um, talked about this, but you can see these saturates and aromatics are much more mobile than the resins and asphaltines. And so when you um, produce, what you're leaving behind are the resins and asphaltines. Uh, another EOG slide that I don't have, have in here is their enhanced oil recovery, which is in their investor presentation. And many of you have read articles, I'm sure, that says, well, the Permian Basin isn't going to produce as much oil as uh, we originally predicted and so forth. Well, that's true. You're probably going to leave a lot more behind, but the enhanced oil recovery out of the Permian is going to be sensational, as it is elsewhere. So if we look at the source rock versus the oil, you can see the source rock is going to have lower amounts of saturates and aromatics compared to an oil. Okay? And obviously the issue with uh, um, uh, fractionation is that absorptive capacity of the uh, resins and asphaltines. So what I took a look at here in terms of different formations, uh, basically the ones I had data on, was I looked at this and I tend to like my polar compounds, again that's the resins and asphaltines, if I had my druthers I would have them as low as possible but I want them less than 20. That really optimized production and so you can see depending where you're at, sprayberry can have up to 41 percent, not good, uh, down to 24 which will work pretty well. Likewise for the wolf camp, not quite as high. The Klein could have some very high uh, um, uh, resins and asphaltines. And the Barnett tends to be uh, much lower overall, and uh, we've seen that uh, just about everywhere with the Barnett shale. The, that's only one indication of its producibility, though, remember. <laughs> okay, so from that viewpoint, you can put a check mark by and say, yeah, the Barnett would work with that factor only. What happens with maturity? Well, we've shown that basically. You can see different wells at different maturities. The uh, resins and asphaltines uh, drop from high levels to low levels. And I've seen this over and over in plays, the Duvernay, you've seen mixed results up in Canada out of the Duvernay, um, that's a Devonian shale. You can find some Duvernay with 80% resins and asphaltines. So if you look at the Baca Murta down in Argentina in the Neoquim Basin, you can see even at relatively high maturity, which I do not understand, you can see 30 and 40% of resins and asphaltines. What is the success been in the vacuum earth, though, in terms of the oil production? Uh, not a whole lot of press on that, is there? <laughs> okay. Gas window, different matter. And then production fractionation. This is one of my fun stories. Uh, I, I told uh, a petrophysicist that, well, this, this is you know, what your uh, rock looks like, your reservoir rock. It's, it's loaded with resins and asphaltines. About a month later, he came in and he slapped down this uh, Sarah report on my desk and said, Okay, I almost said it. <laughs> I, I, it is being recorded, right? <laughs> okay. He said, Jarvie, you're wrong. <laughs> and, and more or less, okay? And what he was saying was that the uh, production report was showing basically 90% saturates and aromatics. And I said, this is not your problem. 
Your problem is your reservoir rock, right? What will get released out of this material? Only that. I mean, this stuff does, does not like to leave an organic rich source rock. And so what you're seeing was a tremendous fractionation going to production. And so are the wells performing up to snuff? No, they're not. Well, again, I go back to this. And going into this issue, I thought maybe it was uh, uh, asphaltine precipitation, I thought maybe it was um, uh, high molecular weight waxes, but uh, it really turned out to be the um, uh, resins and asphaltines. So now I, I want to uh, move into a slightly different topic, and that's that lost oil component. And this is from the Williston Basin, but you can see the upper Bakken shale, a lot of light hydrocarbons in this. Actually, the shale has better light hydrocarbons in it than the produced oil that we received in the laboratory. What does this tell you about its ability to hold on to oil? It doesn't have a problem with it. <laughs> okay, it doesn't want to give up that oil. Now these were all these, well, these two samples were stored in North Dakota for a year before they were released. You can see the middle member, wow, th this is, these are the same, this is what's being produced, and this is my uh, reservoir rock. Well, looking a little bit more closely at that, you can say, hmm, I wonder what's happening here. So, the way I look at this is, is via GC data. So, my combination, I, I like carbonate carbon, TOC, rocky valve, and GC data, as well as when I can get at the aromatic uh, 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 hydrocarbons. And I can make a pretty good prediction from that. So the GC data I like for this restored oil, which is a crucial factor. So you can again see how much material has been lost. Basically, we're out to the C15 range. When you look at this, I'm looking at this, and this has been known since the 1930s, that when you put the molar yield of different alkanes or different molecular weight ranges, you have an exponential fit. They, they change exponentially. So now suddenly you can go in and say, well, these are largely unevaporated. I can't say they're totally unevaporated. Largely unevaporated. So you can fit those. You can see I'm starting at C15. You can see the exponential fit. Of course, we're going from very high values to very small, so that tends to make that a very uh, high correlation. But you can see that the correlation is very good. I like to look at it as purely as a slope, so I just do a, a, a log scale. And you can see, you can compare different oils just by that scale, a lower maturity oil will look like this, and a higher maturity oil will look more like that. One of the things that actually ConocoPhillips has patented it is looking at the, these um, uh, exponential factors to predict API gravity. So uh, Albert Hobel and others at ConocoPhillips take this number and correlate it to uh, API gravity, both for oils and to, uh, uh, more importantly, to uh, rock extracts. So now we have this equation, what can we do with it? Well now we, we could only go out to C15, but when you extrapolate that back via that equation, you can see you can restore, at least mathematically, down to C1, okay? So how well does that work? On volatile oils and condensates, it seems to work very well. On black oils, don't even go there, <laughs> okay? Uh, they have a different profile altogether. But on volatile oils and condensates, so I go back and I look at that restored middle member oil versus the extract, and when I do that, you can see the uh, pre-exponential factor are different. That's a function of concentration, but the uh, exponential values are virtually, well, in this case, they are identical. And if you look at the ratio of gas to oil, they are also identical. So what I'm doing with that then is using that to predict uh, uh, GOR values. This is a nice data set that uh, uh, was provided to me where they had reported GOR values. Again, a bit of a moving target here, remember, <laughs> okay. Uh, kind of like vitronite reflectance, it depends when these GORs are taken, but, and then we made this calculation from the light hydrocarbons, and you can see the fit. Is there noise? Oh, absolutely, there's noise in there. I'm tickled pink plus or minus basically a couple hundred, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, when we look at um, these, uh, the Permian Basin, this is a, a data set from um, the Delaware Basin primarily. Um, it looks like there might be some Midland in there, but nonetheless, you can see the production uh, gas ratio to the normalized C1 to C5s. Again, very good fit. You can see that uh, initially when we took the initial 30-day uh, production, you can see that that's good fit. 
Unfortunately, I didn't get oil samples here. Um, one case where I, I've seen this happen, that, that certainly changed when uh, the uh, GOR went up by production, the GOR went up by the re restoration process as well, okay? Because originally I thought, well, maybe, maybe we're below the bubble point, maybe uh, just factors unrelated to geochemistry that are uh, affecting this. And, uh, and at least in that one case, I just don't have enough cases uh, to do that. So I tend to call this intrinsic GOR because it does reflect what's in the reservoir. Here's some um, intraformational variation in the wolf camp. Um, this is pretty close to the noise level, so 2,900 versus 3,100, so I wouldn't wanna <laughs> bet the ranch, but what this does tell us is whichever zone we pick, we're in the bottle of the oil window based on the SPE. I wanted to make sure you got that last point, so I must have put a duplicate in there. Huh? Now, there is another factor then to account for, and that what, uh, what would happen if we had a nice, reasonably tight reservoir rock, but suddenly we see excess methane in it, okay? Well, this is showing, this is, again is data from Don Rocher at uh, Geomark, and this is actually from uh, either Scoop or Stack, I don't recall which, but basically you can see the maturity trend, increasing maturity here, you can see diamondoids, so diamondoids have been touted as a maturity component. They do show that relationship. But here you have some low maturity oils with high diamondoids. What does that tell you? You've got a secondary charge of gas coming in there. At least that's what is implied from this data. The beauty, the part I like about this is, I love the quantitative uh, aromatic hydrocarbons. When you get that, you also get the diamondoids. So now I can check and make sure that, okay, I, I wouldn't want to make one of my GOR predictions in a case like this because it would be way too low. So that provides uh, a, a bit of information. Now, Alpine High, uh, very interesting area, a lot of press on this. Um, I uh, did some work, um, um, Dan and Kent, you might remember, John, um, Dallas production going and looking in Reeves County for Barnett Shale equivalent for shale gas. Yes. And uh, back in 2000, I, I can't remember, I think it was 2003, but I'm not sure. One of the wells they drilled, uh, Faskin 34, they drilled several others and then Jake Cleo Thompson took it over. But um, uh, I had this data setting around and you can see uh, here's a bypass pay, but it really wasn't, their target was the Barnett Shale for gas and it really didn't have the maturity Okay, so uh, it produced, uh, uh, I think, if I recall correctly, it's some 60,000 cubic feet of gas and eight barrels of condensate. And uh, th there were other issues, certainly, with mineralogy and the like. But one of the things I like, then, is this oil saturation index is just looking at the S1 to TOC ratio. Okay, you can see there's a lot of carbonate here. There's nothing holding that oil, <laughs> okay? It's all carbonate, like the middle member of the bucket. So. That is a zone that I don't believe has been uh, completed or tested, so that's why the question mark is there. So that, that kind of leads into this area of interest. Uh, and John Chrisman, uh, who is he the CEO, I think, of uh, Pioneer? Uh, Apache, I'm sorry. I can't, sorry, I'm mad at looking at you. Okay, they publish, I love this, they publish these chromatograms, okay? But they publish them as histograms, you know, sort of taking the thunder away from the geochemistry. Ah, come on guys, you didn't fool me. So what did I do? I sat and laboriously integrated each one of those histograms, okay? Now I have a GC trace from this area where I have no oil sample, no other data, so I love it, <laughs> okay? Um, and you can see uh, some of their um, uh, GORs uh, for some of their wells is uh, pretty high, at least the 24 hour. So I went in and I looked at uh, different of their wells in, um, uh, uh, from the Barnett and Woodford. You can see they're very similar but very high GOR, whoops, GOR ranges. When you get, this is just a slope factor and BP used to use these uh, slope factors but you can see you're really in that wet gas condensate window. So the, the, the value, this is about the end of the um, uh, black oil window, somewhere between 1.3 and 1.2. Okay, and when you get above 1.25, you've really moved into a different zone of uh, completion. So 
Uh, and these are wolf camp. I, I actually, this is one wolf camp uh, that I had, but I went back and I found some lower maturity wolf camps because I wanted to see how they fit into this, even though these are Barnett and Woodford. So you can see, okay, going to be a little more gassy, at least in the Barnett and Woodford. Uh, not necessarily, though, in the uh, uh, Bone Springs and uh, wolf camp of Hole. So I don't know. I didn't digress too much. Are we okay time-wise? Um, Okay, uh, synopsis. A lot of times I put a synopsis in at the end and say, well, you heard everything. You should know what the synopsis is. But since I have time, sample quality, an issue. Uh, those SARA components, you probably haven't heard a lot about those up until the last few years. Uh, when I consulted for Core Labs, I said, this is something we have to have when we start looking at the Midland Basin. So those of you who are members of that consortium, you have those type of data along with the aromatic hydrocarbons and the diamondoids. Um, so you, you know I like these because we can reproduce it and we can do it on oils and rocks. The restored oil, so that lost oil component, but we can restore the S1 and get the, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, resource in place calculations. We can get the uh, total oil, compare that to what it could have generated, see how they compare, and we can also get the gas to oil ratio as well as API gravity. And these API uh, the alpine high is uh, characterized by greater than 7,500 uh, GORs. So I think that's it. Uh, I know it's after 1 o'clock. I don't know. I was told that people. Uh, Commonly have to leave around one to get back to the office and work. I don't know why you go back on a day like this, but if you have to, do a go. Dan's got some, he needs to leave no later than, I guess, 1.30ish or so yeah. to be safe. So he does have time for questions. But first, I want to give him his speaker's memento. Oh, I get more than lunch. Wow. You get a <laughs> lunch and a, ro and, and a rock because you're, oh. you know, and this is a hard rock. We moved away from the limestone. I'm going to guess this is a, I'm not sure if it's supposed to be a grano diorite or what, but here you go. <laughs> it's Texas. <laughs> and uh, uh, as Dan said, the slides are available. Linda Sternbach, who's filming, she does a great job on that. There's a, a she runs that committee, or there's two crews at film. So this will end up on the website, both as a YouTube video, and I guess the slide set will end up on the website. So. If you're not an HGS member, you should join just so you can get Dan's slides. <laughs> so, time for questions. Uh, yes, sir. Just one on your Sarah analysis. What type of wool sample do you need? Can you get it from cord cuttings, or does it have, where does it have to come from? Yeah, the question is, uh, what type of sample do you need for a Sarah analysis? So, an oil sample or a rock <laughs> extract, either one works. They put it through a process called liquid chromatography. One of the important things to note, and I took it out of this presentation, is look at the topping loss. <laughs> okay, there's a little box on Geomark's reports that says topping loss. So you'll see that it's, uh, you know, 60% saturates, 50% uh, aromatics, and so forth. But then you might look up at this top and it might say there's 20% that was lost due to evaporation, or it might be 90% which means, and the loss is going to be saturates and aromatics. It's not going to be resins and asphaltines. So you're underestimating, in most cases, saturates and aromatics. Okay. Yes? When you were talking about fractionation during production, sorry, you kind of lost me. What happens? Do the lighter ends come up, or do they, are they held back? No, the, the lighter, the, so everybody heard the question, I think. Uh, what happens? No? Did I hear no? Okay, I'm going to assume you did that. <laughs> okay, so what happens is certainly methane, I like this word, fugacity, the fugacity of methane, <laughs> it tends to move everywhere, right? <laughs> okay, so think of that as your optimum molecule to move around. What's your least optimum molecule to move in petroleum? An asphaltine. Due to molecular size, due to polarity, and those absorptive characteristics, the interaction. So when you're producing, you know, if we all got, try to get out this door at the same time, right? 
we're going to all run into like a fire drill or something like that, and eventually it's going to be one by one. Hopefully nobody gets left behind, but in some cases in the reservoir, those resins and asphaltines get left behind. So that's where the fractionation comes in. So think of it, the, the other thing I, I, I like to illustrate it with is with uh, Velcro. So suppose we had a tube with Velcro from here to the other end of the room, and, but it's just big enough for us to get through without having any Velcro wrapped around us. But then we wrap Velcro around us and try and get through that. <laughs> okay. It's a very different story. The resins and asphaltines do migrate as long as they're in solution and have that gas push. The problem is when you start draining the saturation, particularly the aromatics, you lose that solubility. And so they are left behind, and so what you see at the surface is an issue. Okay? And of course it depends where you see it at the surface too. Uh, uh, the separator, the stock tank, or whatever. What, and things such as the choke. Uh, there's so many parameters, reservoir parameters and operational parameters on that. Uh, uh, the faster you open it up, you might flush those out. But I also view it as the stimulation effect. So instead of thinking of uh, this being from the reservoir to the surface, Think of this as being the fracture length from here to that wall. Well, we're moving molecules out of that source rock. The same issue is happening. They're getting stripped. You're getting lighter and lighter oil eventually moving towards that well bore. And what do you see? You see GLRs go up. You saw how quickly it went up in the wolf camp. I mean, this is fairly normal. Uh, and so I think uh, Mike Conway at Core Labs always talked about don't open that well bore all the way up. And I think he was exactly correct, okay? Now, we're, we're trying to drill a well in Mexico. I want him to open that sucker up. <laughs> I, want a, I want a big press release, <laughs> okay? But in terms of EUR, that's exactly the wrong thing to do, <laughs> okay? So it really is that stickiness of those molecules, uh, trying to get them to move. And I think rather than the production issue, that the movement within the fracture network is probably far more important in terms of understanding these systems. Yeah. Yes? So along with that question, you showed the one pie chart of the Sarah analysis of the rock and then of the oil. And is there any other published studies that go into that that have uh, the completions data or like you're talking about the fracture length or things like that that are more detailed? <laughs> well, uh, if you're a member of the Core Labs Consortium, I know they are always battling to get production data, okay? They have all the characteristics, uh, at least now in the, like the Midland study, um, and some of you who are members probably know more about that. Uh, uh, I haven't seen it in, in quite some time. They always have a struggle to get production data, of course, <laughs> okay? So my limitation on that is I'm limited to what drilling info, what uh, IHS, uh, what the railroad commission, just you know, like everybody else, I guess. <laughs> okay. So that, that's, that's as far as it's gone. So in a way, when I told you I, I preach a lot, okay, a lot of this is assumed, right? This is what's happening. I mean, the evidence points to that. So I think the assumption is quite valid. There's certainly other factors in that, though. Yes, sir? You mentioned very briefly, I think, EOR potential in the, in the Permian with respect to <coughs> And that's the part of what you're sure about. Um, is it due to the uh, uh, alteration in wettability due to the, due to the uh, resins and asphaltines? Well, it's a lot more than that because I tend, you know, and we think of things at the surface. Yes. So we have asphaltines, we have resins. In the subsurface, they're all together. So you have saturated and aromatics that are sorbed into those structures, okay, into the asphalt, including the carriage. Okay, so it's not only the fracture nation, it's the, what's sorbed in there. So when they do the uh, enhanced oil recovery, what they're doing is solubilizing some of that oil and getting it to move out, okay? The Midland Basin, because of maturity issues, okay? Uh, you'll see that the potential for an enhanced oil recovery in the less mature area, areas is going to be quite huge, I think, okay? And EOG is, is showing that in the Eagleford. I don't know that they've done anything or reported anything anyway on the, uh, on the uh, Delaware Basin. And that's kind of a different situation. So the enhanced oil recovery to me, uh, 
I, I'm tempted to move more in that direction myself to try to understand that better and make some better, um, oh, and promote some ideas maybe that might enhance that because it, it is what we're leaving behind, right? If we're getting 10%, oh, that's a mere 90% of the oil that's left behind. So uh, I know people have tried it on the Bakken, uh, and that's you know something like that, huge oil content, but you're not going to flow that. I mean, if you drilled a well, horizontal, vertical, in the Bakken shale, let's say a partial, you'd get some flow. Wouldn't be commercial, okay? Um, and really, my experience goes back to Monterey. That's where I started my career in the Monterey formation. So I'm used to dealing with um, 15 to 20 gravity oil. And you can imagine uh, the issues in that type of setting, uh, primarily resins and asphaltines. One of the neatest uh, situations I saw was in the Santa Maria Basin. I just love when people using a good idea. Santa Barbara County. Okay, where wouldn't you want to be anywhere in the world? Santa Bar well, besides Europe, Santa Barbara County. But this company is taking the gas that they produce from um, uh, their um, Monterey diatomite wells, okay? They're using that to heat gray water from the city of Santa Barbara and re-injecting that into these diatomites and getting nice production out of it. I thought, what a nice closed loop. I just love that. Good technology, good idea. But the well wasn't performing, I can tell you that. <laughs> okay. And so, and we knew this, looking at this particular area, that there were problems with production. Can we make it work? Okay. And, and so, uh, like I said, yeah, I thought, well, what issue is this? Is it asphaltines precipitating? Is it maybe even high molecular weight waxes, like we sometimes see in the Gulf of Mexico? Eagleford actually has uh, C40 plus waxes, so you've got to, got to be able to deal with that. That was my first look at it. When we got the Sarah results, I said, whoa, wait a minute. Voila, <laughs> we got a problem, okay? And the reason being because those, those uh, resins and asphaltines are so viscous, they are just going to choke that, those uh, pore throats uh, as soon as you start flowing that. I mean, it just, they just don't move <laughs> very well, I should say. So uh, his basis was, you know, and he's working on a project that we're both trying to make work. And uh, 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 the Sarah results look to be quite in contradiction to the uh, reservoir rock. But my argument is the reservoir rock is what's ruling the production. No, I, I, to my knowledge, uh, I don't know of any other data other than that, that the production was poor. Why? That was a real issue, okay? And uh, there were partners in the well, so somebody may have had that, I don't know, but uh, it, it really didn't work out, and I don't think it's going to work out in that particular play, except for gas. It's interna an international play. Okay, well, with that, again, Dan, thank you very much. Thank you.